Right, the, uh, I was here a little while ago uh, for the Kel uh, Celtic Studies uh, uh, meeting uh, and uh, it's always very interesting to see the contrast between, uh, in some ways, what has been going on in archaeology and what is going on in Celtic Studies. Celtic Studies, of course, is very much a language-based uh, subject and we are only a small uh, uh, archaeology is only uh, a small uh, part of it. But it does have implications because when we find we're looking at the Celts, there are a lot of uh, linguistic uh, models and paradigms which uh, uh, are being used. And this, in certain areas, does produce a, a tension between the two uh, different uh, subjects. And uh, so one, for instance, gets the, the true model, the standbound uh, model of the uh, origin and development of the uh, Indo-European uh, languages. And uh, this then has implications because we see great continuity in the language. To what extent do we see uh, continuity going on in other aspects uh, of culture? And this is one of the, uh, the, the problems that, uh, well, you'll be seeing uh, Ray Carl and myself arguing uh, about this uh, coming from our rather different uh, perspectives. And uh, we have this sort of idea of continuity uh, uh, going through. Uh, but uh, one, for me, one of the problems is that uh, continuity is also assumed uh, for other aspects of uh, culture. And uh, we certainly uh, should not be doing that. And just to give you sort of an example, one of the things that, uh, uh, that originally brought me into a uh, problem with the, the cows, because uh, by my nature, really, I'm an excavator, I'm someone who is dealing with uh, economic and uh, social matters like urbanism and so on and trade. And so the, the Celts were, for me, uh, for a long time, were not uh, uh, a center, er, central area of study. But then suddenly I felt in the 1980s, things are going wrong and we need to come back uh, and have another look at it. And one of the books that did this was uh, this book on uh, Danbury. Uh, and uh, what uh, we see here is a sort of concept of Celtic uh, society uh, and uh, a structure which is built up on uh, the, uh, uh, based largely on the literature and then imposed on the uh, archaeological record. So the idea that one has got a hierarchical uh, society uh, with a king or chief uh, uh, at the top and then various grades. Um, it's an interesting society because, as you will notice, there aren't any women or children. Uh, so uh, there are uh, sort of problems with this simplistic thing. Well, J.D. Hill has talked a lot about the problem of these sort of tri uh, triangular, um, uh, these, uh, triangular uh, structures. And, uh, these, uh, uh, and the problem is that it's because of, we have societies who are speaking Celtic languages, it's felt you can just hear it's felt at that time, you can just put the two together. So you could use the evidence from Ireland uh, in the early Christian pe uh, period alongside uh, the information that we were getting uh, from Caesar. So this contrast between, uh, or this evolving <coughs> together of what was an urbanized society in, in Gaul and uh, what was a very different sort of society in Ireland. And it lies, behind it lies other concepts of uh, uh, colonialism and so on, of unchanging uh, native societies. Oops, what did you have? And uh, it's this figure which sort of in many ways uh, uh, absolutely characterizes this. This is the Celtic warrior uh, from the Andover Museum where the Danbury material is, uh, uh, is displayed. And it was put on a, a cover of a popular magazine, only about a logical magazine, only about three or four years ago. And yet uh, this individual here, he has belt fittings and a brooch from the 5th century BC uh, from Central Europe. He has a torque from the 1st century BC uh, from uh, Britain. Uh, he has a shield uh, from, the, uh, uh, from probably the 2nd century BC, probably from uh, France or somewhere like that. And you know, you're just putting it all together and you make the ideal um, Celtic warrior. Well, it's not like that. And I think we, we really should, uh, should have been moving on uh, from that. And out of it came this sort of concept of Celto-skepticism. It was a critique of 
uh, Celtic uh, studies uh, and the way that they were being used in uh, archaeology. It largely started in Britain, indeed, it largely started uh, amongst uh, English uh, uh, archaeologists. Uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, people like myself, Tim Champion, Tim Taylor, who should be here, uh, and, uh, but it was also being to happen in Spain. There were always claims it was just the English archaeologists who were, for some reason, around Celtic. I spent my year, my whole life, digging up people who spoke Celtic languages. Why should I be uh, anti Celtic just because I'm an Englishman who's doing this? And uh, so there was a, quite a battle uh, that started developing. But as I said, we had it in Spain, and there's certain problems in France are a bit different from how we had it there. We had it going on in Austria and Germany, and a lot of people could sort of pick the, these things up. But it's also uh, sort of impacted on language and literature with uh, Patrick Sims Williams uh, uh, from uh, the Professor uh, Aberystwyth. This started off with uh, sort of a couple of books. Uh, the, uh, the original one uh, written by Simon James, which uh, still uh, gets uh, upsets uh, the Celtics. Hopefully, uh, some of the things that came out later, later are a little bit more uh, acceptable. But um, we have uh, the, the book, The Celts in Britain, which is uh, written by Mark Morse, coming in from a perspective uh, which is uh, uh, from the history of science. He's not uh, an archaeologist, so it's not only archaeology. And then there was uh, uh, my own uh, book, which takes a rather more uh, European uh, perspective, looking at the way that uh, ideas develop. And then this simply seeing where ideas came from, uh, we've moved on to, certainly for the archaeological material uh, in uh, in pre and proto history, uh, I think a very different uh, perspective. And so, uh, what was, I think, in some ways going on was there was a paradigm shift taking place in archaeology, but it had hardly touched uh, uh, studies. And so, as archaeologists, uh, I mean, I belong to the new archaeology generation, we we're rejecting the sort of philology based uh, culture history approach of. Uh, Cossina and child and so on, and concepts like culture groups and, uh, and culture, and, racial, they, uh, and they're concerned with racial origins. And I use the word racial very specifically there because uh, it's very different from uh, talking about ethnicity. And also, simply saying, well, the idea that there are Celts in Britain, it is a relatively modern phenomenon. It starts with George Buchanan, who was born not far from here uh, in the Renaissance. Brilliant piece of work, but in some ways it's led us all astray. And from that one, we started getting maps like this, where people were talking about the origin and the spread of, uh, uh, of the Celts. And, uh, well, yesterday I was dealing with the, with the art and looking at the way in which that played a part in uh, the idea that some of the Celts originated in uh, southern Germany and then started spreading out during the last period. When we look at the data, it just doesn't fit at all. And uh, I was working in areas where this, uh, this map uh, just was obviously uh, wrong. Uh, but since then, we've had other ideas about the origins of the Celts. And so uh, there is the kind of Cochran idea of uh, uh, Celtic uh, from the West, that it's something which is starting on uh, the Atlantic coast and, and perhaps starting in uh, the middle of the, if not earlier, uh, uh, in, in the first millennium uh, BC. And uh, I, in the end, simply said, well, we've got to go back to the original sources, because a lot of this is based on misreading uh, or simply ignoring uh, aspects of the uh, ancient sources. And what I've attempted to do here, and a uh, lot of problems with it, but actually to suggest areas uh, or show areas where in the ancient world people are uh, actually uh, talking about Celts. And uh, I'm contrasting this with what I call the modern Celts. So I make this contrast between the ancient Celts and modern Celts, and I'll try to explain why uh, later on. But there is chronologically, uh, there is no overlap. There's a thousand years uh, between uh, what with the, the ancient Celts and the modern Celts, and also a uh, very limited geographical uh, overlap. They are very interesting phenomena, but they are different, and we have to study these things in uh, slightly different ways. 
So there are questions about how can we, uh, how do we actually go about uh, defining the Celts, and uh, uh, and uh, can we only do it from the ancient authors? Can we use language? Can we use material culture? And uh, uh, can we accept the correlation of Celtic languages equals Celts equals uh, large any culture? And this is what I've been looking at from my studies of the historiography uh, of the Celts. And uh, so asking sort of fundamental questions like why are uh, the modern populations uh, uh, of uh, the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, very prevalent, why are they called Celts? Why are Celtic languages called Celtic? How do they uh, acquire that name? What is the Latin culture? Can we define it? Uh, and uh, what has it got to do with, uh, the, uh, with, with the Celts? Yesterday I was talking about Celtic art. Uh, hey, it's something that's not quite as we would uh, expect. And uh, why do we consider that the, uh, the Celts could originate in southern Germany uh, or in, uh, uh, in, in Iberia? And, but, in con uh, but there has been a sort of debate, especially in the 1990s, uh, that uh, it was suggested that, uh, uh, that, in fact, people like myself were somehow anti Celtic. And what seemed to starting to uh, to come up again. Uh, recently at a conference, I was accused of one of the people who was uh, uh, destroying Celtic studies. I would want to be exactly the opposite, somebody who is, uh, uh, sees, sees it as an absolutely great sub subject uh, to be uh, studying. So um, uh, we find sort of quotes like uh, from the Revolves that people like me were doing some sort of genocide in trying to kill off the ancient Celts. No way. And uh, the, uh, I can't actually, I'm having problems reading my screen, which is uh, why I'm uh, having to sort of look around. Quote from a popular book, uh, like many Celticists, uh, I was the opinion that if they ignored the absurdity of the statement about uh, the ancient British not being Celtic, it would go away. It did not. Um, the reason it didn't go away is there is a, there is a lot to be uh, discussed there. And uh, this conflict is still going on, so I'm hoping we're going to get into a position where we can open again the, the, the dialogue, but base it on a rather more sensible uh, 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 approach. But there are also statements like this uh, that, uh, uh, from, a recent, uh, from recent books, um, and suggesting that the idea of Celts uh, is inter uh, derives entirely from language. Celtic studies, yes, that is the linguistic subject, but the Celts themselves, that is a sort of thing, something which comes from uh, ancient, uh, uh, the ancient sources. So when people say, uh, when people like Wolfgang uh, Mai and uh, Graham Isaac say uh, that uh, without language uh, there are no Celts, well, sorry, I work in the ancient world and uh, we have Celts without language there, as it were. So, uh, uh, we have to understand uh, how these terms uh, came into existence. And so I noticed this interesting thing that, uh, uh, that uh, on the whole, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Welsh universities have engaged in this, uh, in the debate, uh, anger and adversity. But uh, here in Scotland, um, there's been a sort of rather negative, more negative uh, uh, attitude. We might uh, talk about that uh, 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 later on. Um, but uh, attacks on these ideas coming from both uh, Edinburgh and from Glasgow uh, departments of Celtic studies. So things to talk about there. And the other reason that things are interesting at the moment is because we are having for the first time a big exhibition which is going to be putting across the new uh, ideas. And uh, yet the press release uh, and uh, and indeed, in one or two areas in the exhibition itself, which is still not open, but I have seen the, uh, uh, the captions, um, there were mistakes still being made, suggesting that the Celts never lived in urban settlements. Well, they did, but they never wrote anything. But we have a world history uh, written by a Celt, or somebody who's pretty certainly a Celt, uh, uh, by Pompeius Trogus. So, um, 
say that these people uh, are illiterate and, uh, uh, and just barbarians, it's rubbish. We've got to change uh, the uh, perspectives. And uh, I was hoping that Thomas Clancy was going to be here, but we have at least one person in Catholic studies who I hope will be putting in a contribution later to explain. I mean, we've, got a, we've lost one of our lectures, so uh, we, we will have perhaps a chance to uh, di uh, discuss this. So uh, we will, uh, uh, I hope, uh, I hope we've managed to improve the, uh, the, uh, the exhibition. But at any rate, we've got to be talking a bit about the theoretical and methodological basis of uh, studies using the word Celt and so on because we all use it. Uh, but uh, how do we get rid of the old misconceptions and how in the future do we use it? Where do we go from here and how can we get uh, a rather more sensible approach to, uh, uh, to these studies? Right, I've taken a little bit too long for that, but I'm, uh, does anyone got any sort of quick comments they want to make or can I go on to my lecture? That might be an idea. Where, uh, uh, that's nice. Might help me as well. Is that better? Yeah. Right. Okay, so here are some of my thoughts about uh, where we uh, should be going. And uh, as I said, a lot of what has been going on uh, in the last 30 years, uh, if you in terms of uh, theory and methodology, has really been a negative uh, thing. We're just simply saying, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and this is wrong. But we've also got to be thinking positively uh, and how we should be uh, doing things. And uh, so you'll be getting a bit of, well, you came in just at the right time, Ray. Uh, Ray and myself have been having a good old battle for the last uh, uh, 10 years or something like that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, at a number of uh, uh, con conferences, especially in Austria and uh, in, uh, in southern Germany. And, uh, um, and I, I think both of us have, uh, have learned quite a lot from it and beginning to understand the different ways in which we, uh, which we think. Uh, but uh, also, uh, I've, I've had conversations with uh, Patrick Sims Williams, and he's been looking at the implications of this in the areas uh, of language and literature. Sorry, from R again. So, uh, what we've got is, uh, uh, as far as the archaeologists are concerned, um, that we've got a change of paradigm. We no longer accept this idea that language uh, can be equated with ethnicity, and this can be equated with. Uh, an archaeological uh, culture group. And in the case of the Celts, uh, the Celtic language does not necessarily equal Celts and does certainly doesn't uh, equal a Latin culture group. But I find the Celtics to think in a rather different way than myself and not necessarily in terms of these sorts of paradigms. So there are fundamental differences between them. I've also talked about a hierarchy of uh, change and say, well, there are certain aspects of, uh, of the, the, the ancient peoples and indeed the modern peoples that can, some, some things have changed very rapidly, other things are really very conservative. And things like genetics, <coughs> without wiping out the population and bringing in a new one, uh, we've had great difficulty in, in changing the genetic uh, makeup. There are gradual changes going on. Ethnicity and language, these are things that are fairly conservative. It's not easy to make people change their language and the conception of who they are. So the Irish have gone through a language change uh, and they're essentially English speaking, but they're still Irish, so uh, those sorts of changes can happen. Social structure and religious beliefs uh, are rather less, uh, <coughs> rather easier to change. The stuff that we deal with as archaeologists and material culture, that really is very, very uh, ephemeral. And uh, so we're certainly dealing with a very different uh, class uh, of data. So I'm saying, right, these are uh, different sorts of data. They are related to one another. We need to study the relationship. But we cannot use uh, this as a uh, proxy uh, for well, looking at archaeology as a way of looking at the spread of language. They are different, different phenomena, uh, and uh, we should treat them uh, as such. So we can compare, but. Uh, uh, but we can't uh, just uh, change one uh, for the other. And uh, 
so um, if we can't uh, uh, do this sort of thing, uh, simply say, well, look, let's look at the archaeology and then look at the origin of the Celts and their language, we can't do it. So why are we bothering to do it? It's, uh, we have people that seem desperate to want to know the origin of the Celts. Sorry, we can't do it. Uh, and uh, we just have to uh, accept that. And all we can say is that Celtic languages were widespread by the 16th century BC, northern Italy, southern France, uh, uh, northern France, uh, Iberia, because we have inscriptions in graffiti, and also people called Celts, if we are to trust people like Epictetus and Herodotus, where our original idea of the Celts comes from. Um, uh, they are also widespread, and uh, people tend, especially archaeologists, tend to forget, for instance, uh, that there are Celts in Iberia, because it just doesn't fit their theories. Um, linguists tend to define Celts, or uh, used to define Celts, as speakers of Celtic language. But at what level is one uh, saying, well, people are uh, speaking something different? The English, Norwegian, and Dutch, we all speak Germanic languages, but that doesn't make us Germans. And so at what level um, uh, are we looking at um, uh, is it the language group, is it language or dialects, accents? There's a whole series of levels at which distinction uh, can be made. And by all I mentions, I was using the term race uh, uh, deliberately. But uh, this is something different from ethnicity, and it is very different or, or, or from that nationality. It is, uh, uh, one has to understand concepts that are being used in the 19th century uh, and be aware of where some of the ideas are coming from. Sorry, my throat is suddenly drying up. It's, uh... We have, I also uh, feel we need to make a distinction between the ancient and the modern Celts. They are different phenomena and they are related, but uh, um, we have to study them in a rather different ways. And so we have the ancient Celts really from 500 BC to uh, about 500 AD, uh, people like Sibelius and Polinaris, and then we have the modern Celts who really start coming into existence uh, around, uh, well, in the, in the Renaissance. So as we've already said, there is a thousand year gap between them, and uh, there's virtually no geographical overlap. Um, how do we define the modern Celts? Um, speakers, uh, of, uh, recent speakers of, the, uh, of Celtic languages, I can quite happily go along with that. But how far can we use self-definition, which I've always suggested that uh, we can use? How do we deal with the Galicians and, uh, uh, and Asurians uh, who claim they are Celts, but most of us would say they just don't fit these, uh, the, these criteria? Who actually makes the decision? I once said, tongue in cheek, perhaps the the organisers of the Lorient uh, Festival in, uh, in Brittany uh, may not be quite so, so stupid uh, as that. We also have this problem of using the, uh, the idea of defining the Celts uh, as people who are speaking of the language in the, ancient Celt, uh, in the ancient world. We have to recognise that there was no classification of languages uh, in the ancient world. And so like, when people talk about languages, they were named after people uh, who, spoke them, who spoke them. And uh, we have, as uh, people are dealing with the ancient history, we have problems with people who are speaking Celtic languages, but who are not referred to as Celts. People who are called Ligurians or, uh, or uh, Germani. And so the modern definition doesn't fit uh, the ancient world. And so, what's this? So when we look at the ancient Celts, there uh, we don't know what the definition of a Celt was in the ancient world, or at least there are lots of lots of them. So as I said, we can't. Do, uh, I don't think we can use language. No classification really, uh, trustworthy uh, classification of languages until the 19th century. And uh, as I said, uh, the language is uh, named after the people. So the people in Britain, they are never said to be. Uh, speaking uh, a Celtic language, uh, they're speaking Lango Britannica. Or, uh, and then to just characterize this problem, <coughs> this problem 
the uh, the tyrant Narbonne, which we are told is a polis Celtici. And uh, but what does this actually mean? Is it ethnic? But this is an area where people were speaking Iberian languages, and what little information we have suggests uh, that they were Iberians. Or is it uh, just ge geographical in Gaul? Or is it administrative uh, in the Roman province of, uh, of, of Narbonese Gaul? So we have to look at each case where uh, this term is being used and say, well, what does uh, this person mean? Just put on here the, uh, the map of the distribution of languages in uh, southern France based on the uh, inscriptions. And uh, we um, uh, and uh, we see that around Marseille there where supposedly the Curians are living, all of the inscriptions we have there uh, are in uh, a Celtic uh, uh, language. Whereas around Narbonne uh, they are all in um, uh, in an Iberian language. For me, it is simply wrong to calling the ancient inhabitants of um, Britain uh, Celts, and we have to simply a historical. And uh, just in the same way as one would not call the Iron Age inhabitants of Scotland uh, Scotty, uh, we have other terms like Caledonians and so on, or refer to the uh, people who lived in, uh, in England. Uh, as, uh, as being English or Angles. So, uh, if we're going to be trying to write history, I think we must try and be as historical as possible and simply accept the fact that nobody considered the, uh, the people who lived in Britain uh, as being cowards. The definition of being Britain is certainly geographical, but, uh, it, it, uh, but uh, it's always a contrast between the Gauls, the Celts, and the, uh, and the Britons. We also have quite a number of uh, sort of hangovers from the culture history uh, paradigm. Confusions between when one is using um, terms like Holstein and Blanten, um, whether you're using it in a chronological way or whether you're using it in a cultural way. And the big area, the, big, the most classic example of where these got confused uh, was at the Heidelberg, where uh, it was considered the later stages were contemporary with Blanten. Uh, further north, and so the, the deposits there, the latest deposits, were referred to as the Laten. But in fact, anybody looking at the material would say, this is Hotstadt. Uh, and uh, so uh, we find the two concepts, the chronological and cultural, getting uh, mixed up. And still at the museum, as far as I'm concerned, because of this uh, thing, there, uh, uh, there is just confusion. Well, these then are some of the, uh, the, the problems that I want to be. Uh, us to be talking about how can we get over these uh, the, these terms, and I play around every time with much more to say. At least I hope I've sort of started uh, a discussion uh, um, which uh, can carry on uh, later, uh, later on. Right, I will now pass over to my chairman. Yes, you. Sorry. Am I chairing you? Yes, you're chairing. Uh, yes, <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs>